Alex Year, managing partner of High Lantern Group. Um, welcome to the pavilion at the Milken Institute. I think it's the first year that we're actually doing sessions here, um, and I think it's a lot more intimate. Uh, we're going to take advantage of this space. I'm going to reach out to the audience. Um, we've got some good news and some bad news. Here is the bad news. We've got only an hour, <laughs> and we're going to talk about movies, about the future of newspapers, about online dating, the future of the media, where the internet is going, and about not a about dozen... Uh, not about Syria? Uh, may, we must, Syria may slip in, but I don't think we'll have time. So that's the bad news. Here's the good news. We have one person to speak to, and that's Barry Diller, and he spent most of his career waist deep in all of these subjects other than Syria. Um, I think everybody knows Barry has had a fantastic career, uh, both in Hollywood, in the media, and in the internet. He's the chairman and senior executive on IAC and at Expedia. Uh, he's been mm -hmm. at ABC, where he ran primetime television. Uh, he ran Paramount Pictures. He helped start the Fox Network, and I could go on and on. IAC today <laughs> is this conglomerate of 150 remarkable brands of online commerce that, as I suggested, stretch from dating, uh, on from Match.com to online video. And we'll talk a little bit of all of that and see where all why, what all this means. And maybe the first question is, what business are you in? Sometimes, I don't know, I wake up in the morning and see what's interesting. But um, I would really say that I, I, I've always been interested in things that I thought there was an opportunity for real change, fundamental change. And then I kind of plowed in because I, I didn't, frankly, know enough not to. I didn't see all the things that everybody else saw, all the dangers, all the impossibilities. And very early in my career, I mean, we started, we started, we invented this thing called the movie of the week, which is making original movies for television. And everybody said, well, this is great. You know, you're 24 years old. They put you out on a limb, and they're thawing away. And as soon as this thing go goes on, you're going to be toast. Because yeah. everybody said, it won't work. Movies on television don't work. Everybody wants series, et cetera, et cetera. So I learned very early to not listen to anyone. Now, <laughs> by that, I mean keep your ears open to anything you find interesting, but certainly don't listen for anybody making conclusions where there's no all there is is the morning line. And the morning line, of course, never tells you what is going to be popular or interesting to people until you present it to them. So it, it seems to me that one of the paths you follow, at least through the way they describe you, is you're always disrupting a comfortable industry. You're trying something that breaks the pattern. Is that something well, you think about? No, of course yeah. not. I mean, that would be, you know, that. <laughs> No, I do not. I, what I do think about is what's interesting to me. You know, all, uh, when we started Fox, I thought, well, there are these three networks. They all look, talk, and act the same. Is there a place for an alternative? And, you know, that is really what drives my thinking, is just what's interesting. To, I cannot predict what is interesting to another single living person. I cannot make that projection. I never have, not in the movie business, not in internet businesses, not in anything. I can't do it. The only thing I can do is say, is it interesting to me in the kind of mainstream of my whole being? Sounds pretentious. I don't really mean it that way. I just mean that you've got to be on something that it's at least a wide path. I mean, yes, I mean, I be, may be interested in growing petunias, but it's not going to exactly set a trend or disrupt much of anything. So to me, it's a wide, a, a wide area that I find intriguing. And I often find it intriguing because I see something, I see something, I come upon something that is not that where, not yet there. And that gives me energy. So let, let me ask you about something that's not quite there, but that's in the news. You are an investor on, and I believe on the board of a company called Aereo. Yes. What does Aereo do, and why is it making so many people angry? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, you know, no incumbent ever wants to see its territory invaded. And that will make people angry if you invade the territory of a closed system. What Aereo is, is simply it's a platform. 
It allows a consumer, if they don't want to pay $100, $150 for cable every month, if they're not absolutely desperate to watch ESPN, uh, it allows them to watch all of the broadcast signals, all local television, all national television, all, all world events and sports, et cetera, for $8 a month. And the, import, the reason it interested me was not particularly that I wanted to go into the you know, kind of newly enabled technology business of antennas, but because I really believe that the, we're just starting with video and the internet. And the internet video has only been around a couple of years because there was no bandwidth for it more than a couple of years ago. So it's just beginning and it's going to absolutely change most things. Most particularly, I hope, it will break up the closed and bundled system of cable and satellite distribution because so I think it's gotten unwieldy. Okay, so just so everybody understands, they don't produce content and they're not broadcasters. They sell a little antenna. Tell us a little bit how it works so everybody understands. Well, the tech it, it is really interesting technology. People say it's like a, a, you know, like a loophole or whatever, but it's not. It's based upon the fact that every American has the right to watch broadcast television because broadcasters got the right for their licenses for free. That was their quid pro quo. So that's what, uh, that's what it allows to happen. Now, how does it do it? It has, a, everybody has a little antenna about this big, and it, every consumer, and that antenna takes the signals that are broadcast, it then puts them up through the internet, and if you're a subscriber, you can, through any form factor, a pad or a big screen TV, you can uh, have all of that programming because, as I say, I, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, that, is, that is settled law. So it, it does allow you to do something, but what it does is it begins to move the centricity from these closed systems to the open internet. And I've spent a lot of years now doing that for lots of other things, and I think it's, I think it's inevitable. I mean, we are not going to have this closed system for, that uh, has been going on for the last 40 years or so since the introduction of cable. And are, are your friends in the broadcast industry cheering you on? You must be joking. <laughs> they are suing us <laughs> relentlessly. <laughs> but we've now gone through two tests. We went through the district court, and then we went through the Court of Appeals. We won both times. Most people will say, looking at the decision, I think all, pe well, I shouldn't say all people, except people who've got a vested interest otherwise, that, the, uh, that what the court said is awfully hard to actually try at trial. Right. So we think the lawsuit is over, but what we think the broadcasters are doing is they're trying to make as much noise as possible, say what a terrible threat this is, and get Congress to act. If they can get Congress to override it, they could put us out of business. I don't think it'll happen, but you said in up for grabs. You said in describing this, you did an interview with Lolly Weymouth of the Washington Post, and you said- uh, Catherine. Cat, oh, uh, Catherine. In, um, in this environment, your friends are really your enemies. <laughs> Why is that? Well, look, whenever you have, first of all, you've got everybody trying to get into everybody else's business. So if you're friendly with Google, my company's very friendly with Google. We, are, we take $2 billion of revenue from Google every year. And between IHC and Expedia, we are also Google's biggest advertisers. We have a great relationship with Google. <laughs> Nevertheless, we don't like them on the tra in the travel business starting their own vertical travel sites to compete with us. We think we're paying enough money to advertise, don't go after, so to speak, the transaction. Don't, don't go after our business. As Google, of course, looks for more revenue streams. Everybody is in everybody else's knitting, which makes your friends your enemies. Now I say, like, friends with a light F, because I wouldn't think they last ever more in life, and I would think that enemies is a little small e. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not blood sport, although people do get angry. So, so you raise an interesting question about how long these things last. Let me ask you about a couple of companies that you've already mentioned that are around now and seem so prominent, and see whether you think they'll endure as well. 
Um, is Google going to be the dominant search company yes. 10 years, 20 years from now? Well, so you know, don't, don't give me nothing for 20 years because <laughs> who would know? Uh, there is almost no conceivable way that I can see. Now, that does not mean there's somebody coming around the corner with something new, though when you think about search, that's awfully hard to do. Everybody who's on the internet in one way or the other is some form of a search engine. So, but Google and Google's dominance, Google is a monopoly in search. It has 65% of the market in the United States. It has 95% of the market outside the United States. It is, it is not only not going away, I think it prospers for certainly as long as I can see. What about Facebook? Where do you see Facebook in five years? I don't have a clue. I, when all of these social networks started, I thought, you know, kind of flavor of the month would come and go, et cetera. Facebook's got a huge audience, but I am not convinced that this form, you know, social networking is such an overblown phrase. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, as I said, actually someplace recently, it's like the printer phone. It's just people communicating with each other. It's just a modern way for people to communicate. Now, that's fine, but I don't think it changes the culture. Twitter can change, but not Facebook, I don't think. So Facebook, to the extent people ever long term, meaning not just kids, college, et cetera, want to share pictures and information and news feeds about their activities, It'll do fine, but I do not think Facebook is 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 a fundamental. Let's call it fundamental. Amazon fundamental. Apple fundamental. Google. Those are to me fundamental arenas. I don't think Facebook is. What about Amazon? You recently went into the book business, or the ebook business, yes. Brightline. Yes, we did. Why would you go into the book business? Uh, Same reason. Tell me why. What's okay. it going to do that Amazon doesn't do? Well, it, first of all. Amazon is a primarily a distributor. We're going to be we're going to be a publisher and a distributor. The reason we did it is simple. Simple. It may be stupid, but there it is. Which was we looked at publishing. There are five, maybe six houses. They've been around for a hundred years or so, give or take a hundred years. So they ha they have been in this business so long that they have such legacy, such complicated ways of doing business. They've disbanded, because their margins have slimmed, they've disbanded their marketing, so they don't really sell books anymore. So I thought, okay, somebody who's got some internet experience and internet sensibility, if you, have, if you can put together a good editing team, which we think we have, you can go into this business on a blank piece of paper, and you can, now you know, I'm not putting these companies down at all, but you ought to be able to, given that you're facing the future and publishing companies don't really understand digital, you have a shot to build a considerably large business. Is that true of all businesses when you look at them, that somebody else could do it on a digital platform cheaper, more efficiently? Well, of course. What do you think's been happening in the last 18 years. Why, why hasn't it happened to the movie business in the same way? It is, is it, happening to the movie business. Why does it still cost business? $100 million to make a flop? Oh, well, no, 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 no. First of all, you can make movies very inexpensively. We made a movie this year for $2,600,000, which is going to get distributed in a month or two. Uh, it, we, we produce videos. We produce what, more videos than anyone else every week. These are three, four, five minute, and they're primarily for you know our comedy sites and others. But we produce videos that look you take a scene from, you know, a four-minute scene, costs us $12,000. That same scene would cost $120,000 if it were a theatrical motion picture in the production scheme of it. I think all, you know, I think all of that is changing. So I don't, I don't think that every business, I mean, look, I don't think you're going to get internet turkeys except for some sites that we've done. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get, you know, shrimp over the internet. I mean, you'll get it delivered to you, but it is not, you're not going to have virtual shrimp for life. But anything where there is the ability, when you have an online 
relationship or network in every area is going to be radicalized by the internet. It's happened in almost, I mean, if you don't want me to cite the endless ones, the only ones that it won't are things that are you know, animate. Okay, so I, I want to go back to the movie business, though, because you know it so well. Why has, have we not really seen this yet in the theatrical release movies? Why are they still large? It's scale? on the cusp. The, the reason is that, again, incumbents, what do they want to do? Exhibitors say the issue of, for instance, saying to you, you want to see, uh, uh, see Iron Man 3, which opens Friday here, open Wednesday. You want to see it in your home. You'll pay $100 a ticket or for four or five people. Uh, it's technologically doable, but theater owners have said, no, you cannot do that. If you do it, we won't play your picture. That's beginning, that's going to erode in some years, not too many, with, uh, with the amount of home entertainment centers that most, not all, but a you know, huge number of homes have pretty good home entertainment centers. Now, that is going to revolutionize eventually, has to, the film business. So it's only a matter, I think, there's one thing that I learned that was not hardly uh, profound, which is do not put your hand in front of a train. Uh, and that is what the internet is. Um, which business would you rather least be in? The theater owning business or the newspaper owning business? <laughs> Well, actually, I think that unlike newspapers, uh, where there really is a true decline in paper readers, and of course, the younger you get, the decline is ever greater. With movie theaters, I think movie theaters are everlasting. I think the community experience of being in a theater, by the way, particularly if you're young, is not replicable. Now, it is for last night, you know, I watched home, Kantiki, this new movie that's coming out. Uh, I'm very happy to not be with anyone. I prefer it. So the idea of lying down and watching a movie in your house is better, but movie theaters are never going to go away. I don't think. So I would profoundly, profoundly, I would resoundingly pick theater. So though I don't want to know, though I really don't want to own any. Right. On the newspaper side, why does the New York Times, which arguably has as high a quality product as you could get in a discreet newspaper, why does it continue to lose money, and is it a sustainable business? Well, I probably am a contrarian here, too. I think the New York Times, which is the paper of record, certainly in this country and in many other places, I think the New York Times is going to be profitable increasingly over the next years as the internet loses the concept that everything on the internet is free. Now we know this was done in the mid-90s when the internet started and every hip, hippie-der person said, no, you can't charge for anything on the internet, it's between us and whatever, and it's all free, free, free. Well, as we know, that model in many cases does make no sense. If you're producing a high-quality product, free isn't good enough. So. It's been shifting. It will continue to shift. The Times is building up a large subscription business. It will grow ever larger. I think that, that it's going to come out just fine. And for all the criticism that the New York Times and its management over the last years, the one thing they did that almost no one else did, they invested continually in their newsroom. They knew that if they didn't invest in having the best product, they would really be toast. So they took the risk and bet their whole company on maintaining this worldwide premium news service. It, in the end, is going to be valuable. So let's string this out a few years, five years, 10 years. What does the newspaper industry look like in the United States? Well, first of all, it's not called newspapers anymore. I mean, that's probably to begin with. I mean, newspaper is going to be around, too, for a while. I mean, by the way, they will, you know, there's no question that you, most people that you talk to who are under 30, 25, think reading a newspaper is crazy business. I mean, why would you do such a dumb thing instead of, you know, getting your information and stuff over 
more contemporary form. Uh, so I don't think they'll be in the newspaper business. What I do think is they'll be in the information distribution system, and if they're not a commodity product, our daily beats is not a commodity product. It's quite niche. It's got the now 17 million uniques a month, which is very large for a pure uh, journal journalistic site. So those those kinds of things where you have a defined audience and you are a premium product are going to be okay, I think, regardless of whether they have any print. I'm going to do the audience thing. one second, but I'm going to ask you a print question. Sure. Um, what were you thinking when you bought Newsweek? Well, I would say I wasn't thinking. How's that? <laughs> I was, but it was stupid thought. What happened is we were publishing the Beast and gotten off to a big roaring start, and um, there was an idea inside our group that you could take Newsweek and you could do a hybrid, both continue to print the magazine, which had a million, still had, well, no, it doesn't, they have, they're digital now, but there were 1,350,000 subscribers. The subscriber base had been relatively solid for a long time. We thought we could convert it, and we thought, and this was the piece of true dumbness, which was that Newsweek in the year before we bought it sold uh, 950 pages of advertising. We said, with our hybrid, with our different sales force, with all of this, and because they were coming out of a horrible, you know, the economy of 8, 9, 10, 11, that we could do better on advertising. Not by very much. We said, you know what, we can sell 150 more ads. That will break us even. Instead of the 150 more, instead of the 900, we sold 600 and lost $40 million. So it was that we did not, it's my fault, did not look deeply into what the risks were on display advertising, which were great. And that was the mistake. Questions for Barry Diller. Are we going to, do we have, do you want microphones? Do you want me to repeat the question? I can do it either way. We have a microphone, so why don't we go to the closest hand to that microphone, and then I'll come up to you, sir. Uh, <coughs> the, the broadcasters have said that um, if they can't win the legal battle in the courts, that they will move their networks onto cable. Do this is the battle about Aereo you're talking about. Yes, yes, on Aereo. Um, do, you, do, you, do you believe that, they're, that they will do that, and you know, how what do you think would be the response? I think there's literally no chance. I think what they're doing is saying it so that enough people will say, oh my God, that would be terrible. That would really disenfranchise a lot of people. Let's get Congress to change the law. The idea that they're gonna go from broadcasting to cable casting and denude, their mo all networks' most profitable business are their owned and operated stations. their local television stations. You know, the idea that they'll rip away the the, the prime time programming, the network programming from the local station and think that the local station is going to survive is kind of silly. So I just think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's what, it, it, look, these companies, all the companies, I used to be one of them, uh, forever, forever have resisted any kind of change. Uh, the, these companies 40 years ago accused Sony of stealing their programming because they invented the Betamax, the, the original VCR. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Do you think that's cultural? They, is it cultural? Why do they resist change? No, I, 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 what decision? fool wouldn't resist change if change might take away a very neat little situation? So, of course that would, I mean, that's kind of natural. Why, why did television networks not get into the cable business? Why, I mean, you can go from there each step of the way. Why didn't television networks start HBO? They had 90% of the audience. Yeah. Why didn't they start ATN? Now, what happens is they usually end up colonizing it. ABC bought ESPN. Yeah. Uh, so all these things get colonized by big media assets, but big media assets tend to start nothing new. Yes, we had a question right here. Hi, I'm Brett Hellman. Hi. Um, I'm actually was a Newsweek subscriber and enjoyed what you tried to do there by bringing writers 
in from all sorts so of you life. Can, you can be a digital subscriber <laughs> right this minute. <laughs> so my question is about music. Um, what uh, there's two questions. What's your kind of vision about music on the internet? And what's your opinion of the streaming services that are out there now? And um, are you willing to pick a winner at this point between the different oh streaming no. services? I think there's great competition. It's too early. I think there's great competition in digital distribution of, of music, music product. Look, you can tell already, I am an optimist. Uh, I hope I'm not a totally idiotic optimist, but I definitely think that the music business, again, the railroad train of the internet ran the music business over. Now, it ran it over again because of the dimness, head in the sands, of the music companies at the time. They, first of all, had a wildly overpriced product, a product that any consumer said, why, for this 40-cent piece of plastic, am I being made to pay 16 18 20 I don't even want all those songs. I just want one or two. So they ha acted with the arrogance of their kind of, their, their hegemony over the world. Well, along comes the internet, and that destroys their business. Their business is slowly building itself back up. Now, with iTunes, with streaming services, Pandora pays now hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm pretty sure, huge portion of their revenue, directly now to music companies, artists, et cetera. So my feeling is, again, a transition out the other end is gonna come a, certainly an internet distributed business, overwhelmingly, and it'll be okay. But is it, is, is it possible that we're in a time where there are these really interesting businesses get much better for the consumer, much great, better for the startup, but much worse for revenue in the industry itself. Record sales, you know, are much lower than they were two decades ago. Yes, they're much lower, but they're better than they were a decade ago. I mean, they're now, it'll take again, we still have, you know, Pandora and Spotify and all of the services still are not that widely distributed. and. This will, I think, improve over time, but there's no question, what does the internet do originally? What the internet do is it disintermediated somebody in the middle, which meant essentially that that cost or fee you were paying to the middle of uh, goods or services or whatever, now can be passed on to the consumer if not taken by the, uh, you know, by the creator. So the, uh, that's the, natu the natural, it is a disruptor. We're in a radical revolution, this internet. It's only 18 years old. We're not even in the second generation yet. So a question back here, yes sir, right in the middle. Get a microphone back there. Barry, I, w I wanna go back to Aero. Can you just briefly tell us, explain the technology. Is there anything that you have that's proprietary and to the extent that you're successful, you know, why won't Intel and 3,000 other people do it? Secondly, what's your financial objective? Is your financial objective to, in effect, tack on individual networks so that the customer can mix and match at a lower effective cost? And third, isn't there a hidden cost here? Because to the extent that you're using broadband, you're gonna be consuming a lot more broadband. Somebody's gotta pay for those bits. All right, backwards because then you'll have to remind me of the first one. Mm -hmm. on, on broadband, no. Broadband, broadband is increasing. I mean, you're now being offered 50 meg. Uh, they're gonna get more spectrum. Without any question, there'll be enough spectrum. The pricing is though, right now, as you certainly know, is controlled by really the cable business with a little bit of the telco. And the telco's over the top. So I, I, I think that their, that, that their business has such high margins, but very little competition. But here comes Google, now in its second market, offering 100 meg. I don't worry about bandwidth. So as far as Aereo is concerned, and, um, uh, and proprietary. How, how does it kind of work? work? What's proprietary about it? It is ring-fenced. As much as we, f as much as uh, a lot, let me say, meaning we've got patents all around this technology, this platform. And this platform does something 
Again, it's not that hard to do, but it's complicated to do. And it is, we are, believe, protectable. Now, probably not to infinity, but it's protectable. And what it does is it transfers a broadcast signal. I keep using the word transfer lightly because that's not a, a legally, uh, but it gives you the idea. It transfers those broadcast signals onto the internet and then allows you as the consumer to record in the cloud anything you want for as long as you want in a very friction-free way. And it is not that expensive. We're going to wire <laughs> the US. We're going to go, we were in our second city this week in Boston. We'll be in 22 cities by the end of the year. It's not cheap, but it's not, it, it's not a huge capital uh, uh, expenditure to, to plow out these cities. It will be expensive to market it, which we haven't really begun. It's not anything that, I mean, for our company, it, 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 it's not even a blip on the investment cycle. Yeah. What was your second? I think there's Oh, about programming. Yeah. What are we going to do? What we hope to do, and the reason we're interested in this, as I said, is not so much the antenna business, but if we can move that centricity, if we can get 10 million, 20 million subscribers, then w on our platform, with our having their billing address, we can then drive all sorts of other programming through that and further change this centricity from closed systems to open systems, which is what I'm really after. We have a question over here, right on the end. Okay, my, my question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the impact of mobile uh, in the web in general, and particularly in the travel industry, uh, which you know uh, we are, we are, we're working on? The what industry? The travel, the travel industry, industry the yeah. oh. and mobile, right? Well, you know, uh, tra travel. Tra <laughs> we have a very large travel business called Expedia. Uh, it's all over the world. It is growing wonderfully. It is, it I it is of all the companies we have, it is the one you would call an almost pure technology company. Uh, I mean, Expedia has thousands of engineers and has had to invent and iterate the extraordinarily difficult task of taking millions of pieces of information, sifting them as a, in a way that you as the consumer can make easy choices and get what you want done in a much better way than you can by any other method. And that is a very difficult thing to do and Expedia has done it really well. And I don't see anything that's gonna prevent it's growth. It, 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 we are in China rather substantially and in Asia. There's no question that that Asian market is gonna be the biggest market in the world. It is now, in internet terms, that big. So we think for as long as you can go, there's gonna be growth in travel services. And we have no inventory, which is nice. You know, I bet if you were at this conference a couple of years ago, there was probably somebody on a panel saying, telepresence, and internet technology is going to make travel irrelevant. Oh, yes, sir. Why didn't that happen? Because, it, you know, if you breathe, you want to travel. It's in our, you know, it, it, it's, it's in our DNA. You know, you're not, that's not a virtual, that's not, again, uh, it, there, there's very, you can have some virtual enjoyment about seeing places and doing that, but people want to move. People want to travel. W nothing was, when we bought Expedia, literally, and Expedia was then losing money, and, but just we thought on the cusp of, on the churn. The month we signed the deal, 9-11 happened. We had a match clause, and we had like 90 days to exercise it. Certainly this was a material adverse change. Travel stopped all over the world. And the guys at Expedia said to us, look, you know, do what you want. If you want to go forward, of course you have the right, but if you don't, tell us now, tell us early, because it's really hurting the company. And we all sat around and someone in the room, it wasn't me, said, if there's life, there's travel. And I said, that's the thing I heard. We said, called them up and said, we're going forward. Four months later, travel whooshed back. So. When you hear business people saying, we're cutting all travel, what do you, what's your reaction? Because they're not, they're cutting it for a moment, for expedient reasons, short term, necessary, whatever, whatever. 
but we have seen business travel after the, uh, the let's say, 9 to 11 period. Business travel is, 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 is moving twice back up. Nobody, nobody stopped. They cut back. They stopped doing huge Las Vegas conventions and spending ridiculous sums on, you know, on conventioneers. But consumer travel and, and business travel, you people have to sit in front of each other. Now, we do endless amount of teleconferencing, video conferencing, but nevertheless, we also have to go see our customers, we have to see our consumers, we have to be in the market. You know, we've talked a lot about businesses that have declined and then come back. What do you think Yahoo's comeback story is? Well, I think it's, it's sorry, I didn't mean it that way, it's yet to be told, that's the truth of it. Uh, they have a fantastic audience. You know, they still have close to 500 million people. That's a big audience. Uh, however, they're in primarily the display advertising business. Now, if there's a business you would look around and say, what do I not want to do? I don't want to be in the display advertising business. Why? Because there's an unbelievable amount of inventory, and it only grows greater minute by minute, and therefore there's no pricing power. So display advertising is lousy. That is primarily Yahoo's business. They will have to therefore invent, iterate in a way that gets them into revenue streams that can produce more income for them and keep their audience. It's a, it is a very hard trick, but she's very talented. Uh, I saw this morning, I don't know if you saw it, they have a new weather product that was done just in the last several months. So I went to look at it and I thought, because it said, you know, it was different. And truthfully, it's a great new product. So if they keep doing that, now weather is a commodity, et cetera, et cetera, but weather is also something that would keep audience for you if you really got, not that people can't copy it, but the ability to do that and if she can master the constant rhythm of new product, new product introduction, there's a chance. Um, let me ask you about another once dominant company. Why has Microsoft had success with the Xbox and failure with everything else the last decade? Why? Um, you know, you'd think a company that spends six, seven, eight billion dollars a year on research uh, would not have had the internet pass it by, uh, the smaller form factors pass it by, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless, they did. So that's either the story of too big to succeed. You eventually just get so big. And it's, by the way, it's, it's house product is probably the most profitable product ever invented in terms of margin. So it, you can, in a way, understand it. Uh, incumbents don't tend to innovate. And Microsoft didn't in key areas. They've spent now I don't know, three or four billion dollars to get into the internet business, into search and internet related products. They are making some progress. Let's say they're reducing their losses from 500 a quarter, million a quarter to 100 or 200. So maybe the look, whole thing about Microsoft is always that just as it was with uh, the browser. They come in after somebody's done something, they spend a huge amount of money, and then they take the market. Now, I don't think it's going to happen in this case but they may be able to compete because they have huge resources and they're not dope. Let me just twist this one more time. Um, why is Fox so successful as a network, but it can't make a dent against CNBC in business? Well, I'd say that it's, it's you mean you're talking about Fox News? Yeah. Because Fox News is produced by Roger Ailes, who is a master. I mean, he really is. He's a showman, he's a magician, he's a really solid journalist. And he absolutely said, I'm going to put out a product which is completely alternative to CNN. Did so and took the market. I don't think that's happened with Fox News as a product. It does not have a definitional profile. Very hard to do in business, a, a, a particular definitional profile. I mean, you know, what are you going to do? Obviously, you're not going to go anti-business. Nobody could be more pro-business than CNBC. There's no place to play there, I think, unless they do something they've not yet shown. If 
question for Barry Diller. Yes, here in the back. Just need a microphone up there. Right here, one more row, there you go. Barry, uh, you, you made what I thought was a kind of a controversial comment earlier in this session when you said you didn't think Facebook was fundamental. And um, I'm wondering if you're suggesting they're in some kind of decline that the billion members are losing interest in it no. or that they're not selling anything. Um, Look, I don't mean it to be controversial, and, and so to, to, to really clarify, I was not saying that Facebook is not going to be, is not, is not capable of producing really big revenue, which I think it is, does not have a sustainable audience, which I think it does. What I'm saying is I don't see yet. Now maybe as Facebook comes out again with, the, you know, with their mobile product, which takes over essentially the little form factor, maybe they can move themselves into, via their audience, fundamental. What I am saying is, is that like anything that is social in nature, which therefore simply connects you to you, or to your wider world, or whatever you want to say, but it's a connectivity uh, world. I just think that is different from, different from Amazon. Which is which? Which uh, you don't need me to describe Amazon for you, nor Google, nor Apple, and so I think there is just a difference between them. I'm not saying it's not in any way. I'm not negative on Facebook. I just don't think it lines up with these other entities. Does that clarify? Because that's what I meant. Amazon is fundamental, um, and you know a lot about disruptive retail at the panel later on this afternoon on this subject. What should Best Buy be doing? The only thing Best Buy can do is get some sort of a relationship with the consumer that is unique and gives very, very good service for a certain niche. Obviously, most people, not most people, but growing numbers of people, which is what hurt Best Buy, have found that buying things over the internet is just better. You can buy, you can price compare, big screen televisions, you can do all these other things. But for service, it's possible that, that uh, Best Buy, I thought their geek squad was genius. Yeah. And, uh, and if they can do more of that and have a different relationship. But it's hard, it's hard for a, 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 a hard box retailer other than Walmart. But it's hard for a retailer to compete with this, again, this train that is every year moving better down smoother tracks. The products are getting better, meaning the, I the internet retailing products, whether you do it in art or you do it in refrigerators. But that all those services are getting better. And they will tend to, not completely, disintermediate uh, any other form of distribution. Question for Barry, yes, in the back here. Let me get a microphone. Last you row. Know, when we started, I'll just do one thing about this. Yeah. When, when I started in the home shopping thing at QVC, uh, we started doing retail advertising, and I found one ad that I absolutely adored, which defined the space, which was buy underwear in your underwear. <laughs> and that's hard to beat. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yes. Still don't have a mic. Do we have one right here? Right here. Thank you. Can you just talk about Netflix and what your perspective is Great on that? Great question. Sorry, what about it? What do ne I think? Netflix, yeah, what, where, do you, where do you think their future? Obviously. I think their future is very solid. They did, you know, as Reed Hastings has said, you, I'm sure you've all heard about it, he did make an anti-consumer mistake or two along the way trying to get rid of his DVD hard business and get into the virtual streaming business. But he course corrected quicker than most people would. And then he did an extraordinarily bold thing. You know, now everybody says, oh yes, House of Cards. Smart thing to do. Two years ago, when they put down 100, actually then I think it grew to $150 million for a single product, a uh, single show, 
I mean, most people would have said it's madness. What was your reaction? Oh, no, I loved it. Because I thought, again, to me, anything that gets people to say, I like these open a la carte systems, and to some degree, well, Netflix is a subscription system, it's a very inexpensive one. Those systems, I'm in favor of them growing and growing and growing because they provide alternatives, competition, et cetera. But anyway, him pulling that off and then saying, I'm going to continue to buy all the old stuff I can get, but I am going to make for every Netflix viewer, every ne Netflix subscriber, little pieces of cherries on top every few weeks or months or so is, I think, a great strategy. And HBO would have done this. But HBO is part of a big conglomerate, and for HBO to untether itself from the closed system and open it on the internet so that you can subscribe directly without subscribing to cable is, again, I think somebody, you know, just holding, you know, their, their hands in front of what I think is the technological wave. So your advice to HBO would be make HBO Go a standalone app? Absolutely. Now, you know, on. I understand the issues. They have a lot of revenue from cable. I don't think they'll lose many cable subscribers. I don't think that cable is going to, you know, I mean, I think everybody is going to get competitive with everybody else. So I think so. But, you know, there are wiser heads at Time Warner, and they're doing what they think is right. Right over here. In, in light of uh, your enthusiasm for a la carte and the opening up of the system, what's your point of view on the recent significant escalation in the cost of sports programming, where a lot of that is underpinned by the economics of a closed system? Well, I think that, you know, I, I spoke about it a bit earlier, but, you know, when you think about it, um, over the last years, and it's totally natural law, programmers have gained leverage, particularly sports programming. Cable cannot have an offering that's going to get subscribed unless they have sports. And that has resulted, together with network broadcasters being able to charge for their signal, which has added mm, three or four dollars, probably adds six dollars in a couple of years to a cable to a monthly cable bill. The prices have just risen to now, I think most people say, I'm paying an awful lot of money for this thing I have to have because there's no alternative. When alternatives are offered, I think that bold bundle, that idea of a bundled product that if you want to see uh, ESPN, the amazing thing about ESPN is only 10% of the audience watches it. 90% of the cable households subsidize it for the 10%. I think as prices rise, I don't think it holds. If there are alternatives. Yes. He asked, will there be an alternative? Well, sure, the internet's an alternative. And slowly by slowly, or fast by fast, again, video's very young on the internet. Video is still at a stage where most homes don't have the, you know, the nanosecond swap of their internet signal to a big screen. You know, there's Apple, there's Roku, there are other devices. There'll be many more. I do suspect Amazon will have one. I think it will be, because it's very, you know, the Apple's $90 or something, so it's not an expensive thing. I think over the next couple of years, that's just going to be standard. And so once that's done, and you can get everything over this internet protocol, store everything that you want to save in the cloud, I think that is genuinely an alternative. And I think it's a healthy one. I mean, there's a lot of creative destruction that happens, but I do think it's healthy. Why? because the internet is the only form of communication, and it's absolute luck that it ever happened, that in fact, between you pressing a start button, sending something, and you receiving it, you times billions of people, there is no one between you and the sender. There is net neutrality, meaning you send it, it's available to everybody, that is 
you know, you think of it, that's a miracle. No communi every communication system was co-opted into a private closed system. This is the first one. That's why I care so deeply about preserving net neutrality, which is the, I, I'm just amazed. I really do think it's a miracle. Push a button here, publish to the world. Wow. Um, speaking about closed systems, has Apple reached its peak as a creative force? I, who would know? I mean, look, you've got to wait for their new product. I, I, it's every consumer electronic com electronics company depends upon new products. So there's been a period where they've made, I think, really good derivative products. I've got probably seven or eight pounds of big iPads sitting around various places that I live because I'm in love with the iPad mini. So that's a very good derivative product. But for new, they need, they will need, not this year, not next year, so I'd give them a very long leash, they're very talented, they will need new products. When we see them, we will know. Um, you know, somebody in your business has had the good fortune of seeing lots of people who leave businesses in the United States and around the world. And maybe we could just spend a minute if I ask you about a few names. Um, and why don't you tell us what you admire about them or what makes them successful business leaders? Um, I'll start with Rupert Murdoch. Uh, there's no one in media like Rupert Murdoch. There is no one who understands risk better than Rupert Murdoch. There's no one who bets on that risk in creating new things and almost always has. And there's no one that I know, because again, most media companies don't innovate. Why don't they innovate? Because they've got great businesses in their closed circle, you know, in their, in their garden. But Murdoch, all of his life, has been pushing relentlessly forward. Now, he's got a standalone print business that will have two and a half billion dollars of capital and make some money, and he's going to be dangerous because it's, it's now separated from News Corp, so there's nobody around to tell him anymore to not do crazy things. <laughs> and and I think there's, I really do. I, er, when I saw, when, when I said to Rupert Murdoch, I think there's room for another network. And, uh, and it was on, literally, it was on a half a piece of paper, scribbled, of what you would need. He said, let's do it. I said, well, Rupert, you know, first we gotta buy some television stations, and then we got to, he said, well, fine. So Metro Media happened to wander by six television stations in the biggest markets in the U.S. And I am telling you, without simply because he believed that an alternative could come, and therefore the risk to him, even though, as he said to me, we're betting the company, and laughed. Now, I didn't laugh because he wanted to bet his company, but that sense of the ability to take risk and to do it without calling in God knows how many people to tell you why you shouldn't do it. That's, that's, that's original. Tina Brown. Great editor. Simply great editor. Jeff Zucker is now running CNN. First time, I'm, I don't want to insult anybody that was, was at CNN, but it's the first time I get excited about CNN's future. Why? Because he's a broadcaster, because he really knows his stuff, because he's theatrical, because he's gutsy, and because he's got real energy. So I, I think he's a great candidate for that job. Jack Welch. There's nobody like Jack Welch. You all know this. You don't need to hear it from me. Jack's, uh, you know, Jack's wisdom, his energy. J Jack, I think, you know, I don't know, I have overstatements, but Jack may be the best chief executive officer of a large enterprise ever. I mean, just because, talk about enthusiasm and talk about relentless edge in making things happen that the bureaucracy fights. And his wisdom and there are more, there, there are more 
so to speak, management policies that were thought up by Jackson than I think anyone alive. Mindy Grossman, who uh, you hired to run HSNI. She was a great retailer. Uh, when she came into HSN, she didn't really have, she certainly had no on-air uh, on production or any kind of experience in television, but she's grown as HSN into a powerhouse, and she's been great doing it. So on many levels, I'm really glad we put her in charge. John Malone. John, oh no, no, I'm very fond of John Malone is, he's been my partner with one little blip in uh, actually 20 years of being partners. Uh, he has been a truly great partner. And we had one little battle which got resolved uh, and we continue to collaborate and I know of no one in, 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 in understanding the very framework of communications on all sides of it. Technically, because John is an engineer by training. Creatively, John Malone is the father, truly, the f real father of cable. Meaning, he is the one who financed almost every single cable programming venture of, this, of the late, of the mid 70s to 80s. So, it was great. Find me someone I can say something terrible about. Jim Cramer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't bother. He's yeah. all right. Look, you know, he's, he makes a lot of noise. He's in the noise-making business. Um, you have a lot of your life here in LA. Your company is now headquartered in New York, where I understand you spend more of your time. Which city is better? Well, it's better for what? What's well, better mean, for business? Well, it depends. Again, you have to define business. I mean, LA is a working town. It is a company town. It is therefore relatively dull. I mean, there are little extremes, but basically, people in LA work. People in media and entertainment. And they really do really good work. You know, these, this is the age of very, very good television. Almost all of it totally all, but almost all of it comes out of this kind of, this arena, this LA arena. New York's the capital of the world. New York is the most stimulating place. If, you, if you're bored in New York, you're not cognitive. So, you know, uh, and by the way, of course, for a business business, it's the connector to almost everything. And it's a really exciting place. But if you want to be a kind of dog at work, Come to LA, be in the entertainment business, and slave yourself into creating Breaking Bad. You know, um, you run an internet business, and yet there's an assumption that all the talent is centered around Silicon Valley, not New York. It's not true anymore. What are you finding? Where, what's the you look at you? those of you who come to New York and wander around, particularly lower Manhattan. It is now between us and Google is there, and AOL is there, and all sorts of companies really with huge amounts of, in, of technical talent are now in New York, abutting in New York. So it's not true about the Valley, I don't think. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Appreciate your attention, well, thank Barry. You. Appreciate nice your time. Nice to be time. with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.